I'm Holly Svanieri. I run the Middle East program at the Wilson Center. My apologies for being a few minutes uh, late. Um, we are delighted to have with us today uh, Marianne Gasser, who is the outgoing head of delegation for the International Committee of the Red Cross in Syria. Um, I have asked her to speak maybe for 20, uh, 25 minutes, and then we'll open the floor to your questions. Um, for someone like myself, who was a political prisoner in Iran, um, we count a lot on a visit from the International Red Cross delegation. I didn't have a chance of meeting with them because any kind of visit, I think, has been barred in Iran for a number of years. But uh, the work of ICRC is really something that gives a lot of hope to prisoners, to refugees, to internal displaced uh, um, people, and uh, we all, you know, count on their uh, work and appreciate what they are doing. The delegation in Washington works directly with the United States government and also civil society organizations, and the whole idea of ICRC is to promote international humanitarian law, facilitating its operations worldwide, and also to create an awareness for the job they do, and uh, also seek out a support for their international uh, mandate. Your presence here could have not been that uh, better than now because there is this big concern about what is going on in Syria. You have the floor now. Yeah. It works. It's ah, open. Okay. Yeah. Uh, good morning, um, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much to the Wilson Center to have organized uh, this meeting uh, uh, today. I'm very pleased to, to meet you all. Um, as um, yeah, I was the head of delegation of the ICRC uh, in Syria for almost uh, four years. Uh, I've known Syria before the, the conflict and now um, with in, in Syria being in the middle of the conflict. Uh, I've seen also the difference at the beginning of 2011 when uh, we were, there were more peaceful protests uh, with um, a very big re and repressive response. And uh, the situation two years later has uh, drastically, significantly changed, where there are human humanitarian uh, needs which are growing by the day, and uh, where the country, many areas in the country are completely destroyed. And today, contrary to the beginning of, of the conflict, we cannot say anymore that uh, the conflict is only localized in one or two areas, but uh, it is throughout the country. As it was, um, maybe I will give a little briefing on the ICRC's activities in Syria, our challenges, uh, and uh, the describe the humanitarian situation, but uh, afterwards I will give an enough time the floor for questions and answers, hoping that I can answer to most of the, the questions. The ICRC um, is in uh, present in Syria since 67, 1967, um, and where we, because of the occupied Golan, uh, where the Fourth Geneva Convention is applicable, where we are um, facilitating the crossing of certain categories of people from the occupied Golan into Syria proper, and we play this intermediary role between Syria and Israel. We were never so operational. 
the, uh, the, our main activity is being mainly the, the Golan file. Um, but then when the event started in mid-March 2011, the ICRC uh, tried hard to access especially the south of the country. As you know, the event started in the south, in Dara, mid of March 2011, and where we had heard that there were military operations in the middle of protests, but uh, as I said at the beginning, a very repressive response, and uh, we had uh, allegations that there were a lot of arrests, people wounded and killed. Uh, so it took us, it was not easy to have access to the south because, you know, in Syria, any, uh, any um, access is needing approvals from the government. So finally, uh, it is the ICRC president, the president of the ICRC, who conducted an official visit to Syria at the end of June 2011, and he met high officials who granted the ICRC access to affected areas, provided that we work also closely and jointly with the Syrian Arab Red Crescent, which is the national society, the Syrian Arab Red Crescent. And we did accept, well, well first of all, it's the, the, the Syrian Arab Red Crescent be, being part of the Red Cross, Red Crescent movement. And second, the R Syrian Arab Red Crescent having a presence throughout the country through their 14 branches and more than 80 sub-branches. Uh, the ICRC, um, despite our long presence in Syria, we were only confined more, more than 40 years, mainly to Damascus, so we didn't know so well the country. And the National Society needed also our support, our expertise. Uh, so we managed to go at that time in 2011, as I mentioned, it was mainly the south, the north, Idlib, uh, governorate, and especially Homs and Hama, where there were a lot of um, some military operations. And at that time, we launched um, uh, our um, some programs in order to assist the wounded and the people who, let, who fled uh, the uh, unsafe areas. This for us and for me personally, having been uh, to Syria for such a long time, I saw that there was a new shift, a new phase in early to one year, almost a year later, early 2012, where we were not speaking anymore about protests, um, but military operations ongoing and I would say for the first time that we saw and heard, mainly saw ourselves being going to the field, heavy fighting. Um, so it means between different parties to the conflict. And it's, it is there that I think that more armed groups emerged uh, because in 2011, we hardly heard about armed groups. It is also in early 2012 that we saw that uh, um, more governorates were affected. There were more humanitarian needs. Thousands, we were not speaking anymore about hundreds of people being displaced from one area to the other, but tens of thousands of people who fled the country and others who, l who fled to safer areas. Sometimes in, th in the same city, like uh, I speak again about Homs, because it's uh, the governorate which was the most affected, um, you all have followed, I think, the events in Bab Amr, February 2012, where you we had also journalists uh, stuck in Bab Amr uh, to have lost their lives, uh, where we were also asked to evacuate the dead bodies of the French and uh, American national. And uh, it's what we managed to do, but after three attempts, because of the very heavy fighting in Bab Amr, which did not allow us to enter the the city uh, or, or or the area uh, we did manage uh, for us it was also important not only to evacuate uh, or the human remains of um, the foreign journalists but also of the wounded syrians and civilians who wanted to go out and it was yeah because fighting continued 
it took some time until all the parties respected a humanitarian pause because we cannot enter into an area if the parties to the conflict would shoot at ambulances of the Syrian Arab Red Crescent or at, uh, and at humanitarian workers. Um, and as you know, according to international humanitarian law, the Red Cross Red Crescent emblem should be uh, respected and um, protected. <coughs> And uh, I, I would say it is since February 2012 where the situation became much more violent. It is a very violent, very, um, very strong, um, very violent conflict from all sides. The situation further deteriorated with uh, in mid of 2012 when the conflict almost reached Damascus and Aleppo. Uh, and uh, even today, we have many areas in Damascus, especially in the southern parts of the city, which are completely destroyed. It, it's not anymore that we would see few impacts, bullet impacts on some uh, uh, buildings, but we see now comp uh, um, buildings completely flattened, destroyed. And that's why our concern is all these people who are displaced now in schools, in public buildings, in hospitals or mosques, let's not forget Syria, is a very secular state, so you have uh, an, 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 a, still a lot of solidarity. But uh, these people, it would take, it would take years. Uh, if the fighting even would stop tomorrow, it would take years to reconstruct uh, this country, and especially even more to um, uh, reconcili reconciliate the different uh, people and uh, because not one single family, every, uh, every family is affected in Syria, even beat families pro-government, uh, who are pro the, the government or against the government, any family is uh, affected, their relatives being displaced, killed, wounded, arrested, kidnapped, um, and uh, so there is a lot of also revenge uh, and the few S the Syrians that we know, most of them now, are not anymore saying we are for or against the government or or, or the uh, for the armed groups or not. What they want is again a peaceful Syria and more stability. Uh, the ICRC did increase mid of last year its assistance. We had to double our food parcels essential household items, including blankets, because in Syria we've known some areas it can be very cold, in, uh, and especially in, uh, in winter, especially also Homs or Idlib, um, with, um, when, when there is no fuel, no electricity. Um, some hospitals were needing also oxygen. Some hospitals also have no uh, electricity or, fo or water. So the ICRC, together with some other organizations, including UN agencies, we tried our best uh, to provide assistance, medical material, uh, medicines for chronic diseases, uh, med medical equipment, but uh, also uh, to provide food parcels and es essential ho household items, because also a resident population are also affected today because there is no more work the economy is really very much hit. People have no more income. They have lost their savings. And the resident population is also hosting IDPs. And therefore, it is, a it, it is double a burden. I've when we have been to Idlib recently, for example, you know, Idlib, it's a very agricultural land. And now it's more than two years that no one can harvest anymore because of the fighting, so people cannot access any more their land, and this is since o over two years. Uh, they cannot even make work their equipment because there is a lack of fuel, and many people who have left uh, some. So now uh, Syria or the Syrian population is very dependent on humanitarian aid because all sectors have been affected. For us, we are committed uh, to continue our humanitarian work. I have to say it is also becoming much more difficult 
to access some areas, and uh, not only uh, because, um, yeah, it sometimes it takes time to obtain the necessary approvals, but because of the ongoing fighting, we cannot send teams when they are in the middle of military operations. Sometimes our humanitarian poses, the requests of humanitarian poses are not always respected. And I have to say, um, now it is also becoming much more difficult with, with the multiplicity of armed groups. Um, some are, as you know, most of them are not under one command. They are not unified. Some have emerged, we don't know who they are. In parallel, there are some criminal, crimin criminals also. And, uh, but um, we are trying to do our best even to, from Damascus or from within, inside Syria, to go in affected areas. As I said, all the areas are <laughs> affected. Um, recently, we could go, for example, to Aleppo. Aleppo, in the past, it was taking four hours and a half by car. Now it took us recently more than two days because first of all, you have to pass from Damascus to um, then pass Homs, Hama, where you have to cross approximately 30 to 50 government checkpoints. Some you pass quite quickly because you have the approvals. It's not a major problem. Some are checking the trucks, but this is, uh, they are entitled to check. But then from the, the north of Hama, until almost reaching Aleppo, 10 kilometers before reaching Aleppo, uh, the whole area, uh, you have to enter Hama Governorate, Idlib Governorate, Aleppo Governorate. It's, uh, we have encountered more than 30 groups. Yes, you have some of the main groups that we know, uh, but uh, others, we did know who they were, quite well equipped. So some of the main groups also wanted to escort us, to protect us from other groups. We even encountered uh, uh, Jabhat al-Nusra. Uh, and uh, arriving in Aleppo, Aleppo city is now divided. Part of Aleppo city is controlled by the government, the other part by armed groups. And if you want to go in inside the area of the armed groups, like we did in Idlib, in uh, in Homs mainly Homs old city or now Aleppo or Derezor where we had a team even t staying overnight in Derezor city controlled by the opposition because we had to repair some water pipes. Uh, there you you see a lot of humanitarian needs, lack of uh, no more electricity for days, no more water. Even ourselves being in Aleppo, government site, in the hotel, the hotel had no electricity for over a week. So you can imagine for the population how difficult it is, especially for hospitals and uh, for the wounded. So, um, and, but it is important that for the ICRC, for the Syrian Arab Red Crescent, w which remains our main partner, who have very committed and motivated volunteers to assist all sides. Uh, and to do these cross lines, which are sometimes dangerous, we always have to balance between risk and the needs. Um, but it is important for us to um, uh, assist the people in need and to try to save some lives. Now, I have to say, even if we have doubled our assistance, even if last week we have launched a budget extension, um, we, we can never pretend, unfortunately, that we are covering all the needs. Be it us, be it the UN, some UN agencies who are also facing some challenges, difficulties with all sides. Um, it is, and the very few NGOs who are working because international NGOs have major challenges to work in Syria because of the Syrian system, because of uh, um, their, also the capacity and all these armed groups. Um, it, one can never pretend that it uh, is covering um, all the humanitarian needs. So we are focusing a lot on, on humanitarian needs, but uh, I think our 
wish of all of us is that all this stops one day and I think it can stop only through um, a put if a political solution can be found. I know that it is becoming much more difficult. We have seen even humanitarian assistance being sometimes politicized um, because each many parties to the conflict are being more and more radicalized with the, continu the conflict is continuing and uh, um, it is continuing in a very bad direction and uh, many other actors are using a little bit Syria for their own interests so this is not helping and we are mainly thinking about the Syrian population who would need uh, um, would just need to to come back sometimes also with the ICRC and the Syrian Arab Red Crescent has been sometimes criticized to have uh, only assisted government controlled people displaced in government controlled areas this is not true because I was saying we took some risks to go to opposition controlled areas in Idlib, Aleppo, Homs, Hama where we have to cross these front lines but also let's not forget displaced people in government controlled areas it's we sh one should not think that all these people are with this side or that side it's poor families women and children uh, who just want to find a safe place uh, for their children. Uh, some have been displaced three to four times because each time they are displaced in one place, second place, uh, the, the, the place is then being um, um, affected, attacked. And even among our Syrian staff, uh, some of our Syrian staff have been displaced also three, four times. Some have be seen their relatives being kidnapped by armed groups. Some have seen their relatives also arrested by uh, security forces. And uh, so it is becoming very extremist, this conflict. And it can, if it continues, could affect, well, first of all, the Syrian population, but as you have seen already, has a negative impact on neighboring countries. Uh, sorry, um, maybe I will stop here. And yeah, <laughs> sure. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, for this tour d'horizon you g gave us. Mm -hmm. um, how did, let me ask you the first question and then we open the floor to, to your question. How do these groups reach out to, to you? I mean, these mm -hmm. the armed groups, because with the government there is a relation, there is an established relation, but these, and how do you choose mm -hmm. at any given time where to go, how to help, whom to help. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, the ICRC did develop contacts um, on a more a Geneva level yeah. uh, with uh, the Syrian National Council and then recently with the coalition. So we had contacts, we had met also um, um, uh, Mr. Moaz Khatib, uh, at that time also Mr. Khalyoun and uh, some from the opposition living um, uh, abroad, outside of, uh, of Syria. But for us, it was also important to make contacts with the uh, armed groups and also with uh, the local coordination committees, for example, because they are also trying to do their best to assist. Are uh, these the ones who reach out to you, the local coordination uh, Some activists, committees? yes, mm -hmm. but also armed groups. First of all, we could manage to have contacts with them well, in Damascus, but also uh, in Lebanon and in Jordan, because you have also the armed opposition there, that we could either make direct contacts in Amman and Beirut, because they came to our office, or we met them outside our office through Skype. Mm -hmm. And uh, now it is, we have seen through our field visits, through our uh, presence in the field, where we could meet armed um, groups. But it is uh, challenging because even if we have now a good network of armed groups, as I said, it is impossible to, to confirm that we are reaching everybody uh, because of this multiplicity of groups. Some groups do not want even to meet us because they are extremely radicals. And um, so it is a challenge, but uh, we, uh, I think through our field visits, through our contacts that we have in neighboring countries, 
with the armed groups because also for us it's important well first of all when we tell them we want to come to Homs Old City for example to assist the civilian population that they respect the Red Cross Red Crescent convoy the emblem not that we are shot mm -hmm. at although we had some security incidents it's not always respected and the on the other hand is also that we want also to send them some messages that they also have to respect the civilian population. People that they capture should also be well treated. And uh, um, if they uh, want to, um, uh, let's say, take an area through fighting, that they should not shoot at the women, children. So we, we are engaging with them on the basic rules of international humanitarian law. Thank you. Uh, yes, please. And just wait for the mic. Uh, identify yourself and brief questions. Uh, no comments, please. Hello, Falah from Iraq. Uh, I admire the work of ICRC very much. As far as I understood, you were not observing the uh, political situation prisoners uh, before the Syrian crisis. Uh, you were just busy with Golan, and uh, I don't know uh, what uh, do you do. You do that now because, uh, according to what we hear from our Syrian friends, there are more than twenty thousand political prisoners right now in Syria. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's um, a very good point. Um, we mentioned a lot about the humanitarian needs: food, non-food, medical, water. Um, and the, the needs are growing by the day. But we are very concerned about everything which is related to protection. Uh, since you're right uh, that the ICRC had never uh, access to prisons or to places of detention in Syria, even if we had requested in the past before the events. Uh, following the first official visit of the ICRC president, um, uh, the results were very positive and uh, we made a very positive first step because for the first time in 2011 we could enter into a dialogue with the authorities, the Syrian government, on detention matters. And uh, we were granted access to two prisons under the responsibility of the Ministry of Interior. They'd ask us to start with prisons under the responsibility of the Ministry of Interior for confidence building, gaining trust, detention being a very sensitive issue in Syria and in other countries where some countries do not want at all. Now, following the, these two last visits, the last one was in April, well, one year ago, May 2012. We are still negotiating with the authorities to establish a detention program not only to visit prisons, because unfortunately we could not visit more prisons. First, yes, some places are more difficult to access, that's true, but it is very important that our procedures, standard procedures are being accepted. And uh, we hope very soon to, read to um, agree on a detention plan with the, the Syrian government. <coughs> but with, we'll start mainly with prisons. Our aim is also to visit other places of detention uh, held by the security forces, but this, I think, seems to be a little bit much, much more difficult. Now, we have engaged also with uh, some main opposition groups also to visit um, persons that they are detaining. Uh, we are still in dialogue with them, uh, with the main opposition groups, well, are a little bit more structured and uh, we really hope and we remain confident that we would be able to visit some places in accordance with our standard working procedures. The figures of people detained by the government is very difficult as we do not visit. Um, maybe one activity that we are conducting is that we, a lot of families are approaching, are coming to our office and to ask about the whereabouts of their relatives. 
and this we uh, are sending interventions and requesting the authorities to provide us with some answers. Um, the we are receiving some answers with some delay. The number of answers that we receive compared to the requests that we have sent are still little, <laughs> but uh, it is uh, extremely important for the families uh, to know at least the whereabouts of their uh, detained relative. So this is another activity that at least we could offer to alleviate a little bit the suffering of the women, uh, the mothers who are anxious about the whereabouts of their sons. Sometimes we have no answer at all because we cannot confirm if this person is detained by the government or detained by armed groups. So it is uh, very complex, but uh, thanks for your, un because it is a very major concern, detention. Uh, indirectly, you're putting together a list <coughs> of detainees because um, when they come and tell you, so yeah. you're just... Uh, but we take yeah. also some additional information in order to uh, have the possibility to make an intervention. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Uh, this, uh, the lady here. <coughs> we're go I st we are moving left, right, right, left. Yes, please. Hana Akili, uh, Syrian American. Um, I'm wondering where your dialogue with the government has reached in terms of the humanitarian corridors. That's been talked about for a really long time. Um, so if you can just shed some light on that. And one other question. Have you ever been able to make it to the the camps in Zatari and Atma, and if you can give us just a brief overview of the situation, the dire situation there. Okay, thank you. Maybe to answer first to the <laughs> last question, mm -hmm. uh, the the camps, yes, the ICRC, it's not covered by Syria, uh, it's uh, Jordan, uh, that the ICRC is present, has also a program on re-establishment of uh, family links, where we offer uh, Syrians who have lost um, contacts with their relatives who remained in Syria, the possibility uh, to make phone calls through to Rayas, and it's working quite well. Um, other organizations, mainly UNHCR, is providing assistance to these camps uh, in, in Jordan. And uh, so that, that's why the ICRC concentrated mainly in um, and the, um, on the program of reestablishment of family links. Me personally, I didn't go to, to Jordan, uh, but we have a whole delegation who is, who is going on a, a daily basis. Uh, now we will um, extend this program to the one or two new camps which are being uh, um, built uh, or uh, which are being constructed. And also we are, uh, we will also um, assist because our budget extension is also the, the budget will be increased for Jordan and Lebanon in order to increase our medical assistance to um, to some medical posts in order for them to be able to treat uh, wounded Syrians who were evacuated to Jordan or to um, to Lebanon. Uh, humanitarian corridors. The ICRC is not, let's say, in favor of, of humanitarian uh, corridors. I don't know if Francois maybe. <laughs> um, our line is, um, yeah, uh, I know that, that there were a lot of discussions about humanitarian corridors, safe ha havens, and, but um, for the ICRC, it's not our, let's say, modality to. Would you like to add? In terms uh, of humanitarian corridors, I think uh, first we don't remember an example where this has worked. Uh, in our experience, when people start mentioning this concept, it seems that the situation is really desperate. I think we are more focused on, on securing access and respect for the emblem. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the, the, the simply the respect of for the humanitarian mission, for the Red Cross, the Crescent emblem, and through our own negotiation. But the concept, I mean, it looks good on paper to have a humanitarian corridor, but in practice, to be honest, it has, nev it has never worked. Uh, thank you. Uh, Aaron? Marianne, thank you for that presentation. Nothing substitutes for, for being there. Um, Damascus still represents a significant part of the population of this country. Can you describe for us what life is like there and to what degree you can describe normalcy amidst abnormalcy? Thanks. Oh, thank you. 
Yes, um, as I mentioned before, the, the, uh, Damascus started to be affected mid of 2012, some of the areas south of Damascus and especially rural Damascus. When I remember uh, when we were going to affected areas in 2011, 2012, the first part of 2012, um, coming back f to Damascus was very difficult to to uh, to accept, let's say, uh, because Damascus, the city itself, looked c completely normal. People going to restaurants, <laughs> coffee shops, you were going to still to the old city, um, although with less tourism, um, um, hotels becoming more and more a little bit empty, but uh, uh, Damascus was completely normal, let's say. You could not even see any checkpoints in Damascus. You, we were not hearing any shooting or shelling. And uh, nowadays it has changed since the second part of 2012, uh, where many areas in Damascus itself, well, it's, uh, maybe, sorry, I should have taken once a map, but uh, the southern areas uh, of Damascus, for example, near, maybe you heard, Yarmouk camp, Jobar, and other areas, Abun, um, other areas which are still in, in, in Damascus, Rukedin, for example, where you have constant shelling and heavy fighting. So in Damascus now, you on a daily basis, and it's not only in the evening, you work, uh, you are at home, and you hear shelling. Well, some days it's very regular, uh, some other days it's less, maybe every second hour that you have uh, shelling. Um, and then this is also very difficult uh, to because you don't know where the, the things will fall. And even when you hear it falling, uh, or then you, you think how many are now killed and, and wounded. And um, so you have m also much more checkpoints in, in Damascus. Uh, also, where there is very heavy fighting is rural Damascus. And let's not forget, some areas in rural Damascus are only three kilometers outside of Damascus. So we should not think uh, rural Damascus is so far away. Uh, and, but, and you have to cross, to pass rural Damascus to go, for example, to Homs or to, to Idlib. Uh, many shops have, have closed, hotels are empty. So that's why I, I was saying the economy has is 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 really hit, and uh, many people in Damascus who had some means have left the country, and uh, so Damascus is not anymore the same. Still, in the city center, even the old city, I have to say, where we live in Abu Rumani, for those who know uh, Damascus, we you don't see destructions mainly in the southern areas where there is the heavy fighting. But still in our area, Abu Rumani, which is a residential area, we had also mortars falling, and mortars are launched mainly by the opposition because they, uh, you have the Etat Major, you have uh, the Ministry of Defense, other buildings, and mortars are never so precise. So, no, so really Damascus has changed now. It's uh, much more uh, difficult to live in, in Damascus and for the children and women and especially that's why also schools are, some schools are opening, but for the families, I, I know a lot of Syrians were afraid to send their children at school because any time there can be a mortar or suddenly a big military operation uh, ongoing. Following on what Aaron asked you, is there anywhere in Syria that life goes on normally, for example, in Tartus or so on, or no? Yes, still. Um, yeah, in Tartus, yes. Uh, still a few areas in Damascus. Even in Homs nowadays, uh, an area which last year was under heavy fighting, and now the situation is very rather quiet, and you see shops, schools, it's residential area in homes, for example, uh, called Inchaat. Now, Tartus, yes. Uh, therefore, we, w we are renting now also warehouses in Tartus because you have a lot of facilities. You have the port. Tartus is not far away. 
from ho to homes Hama, where you can send quicker and swifter medical assistance and convoys. Yes, Tartus is not affected. Although you have a lot of displaced people, they are displaced mainly in chalets, mm -hmm. displaced from Aleppo, from Idlib, from um, many areas. Mm -hmm. So you have still few areas were not affected. Other areas that we thought would never be affected, like Kunetra, for example. Now it's even, we have not been there for over a month because there is heavy fighting. And a lot of groups that there, for example, we have at this stage no contacts with these groups because we focused a lot on the center and the north and uh, as there is no unification. So yes, Tartus, but has all these um, displaced families now. Yes, please. Yes, Mike is coming. Yes. Uh, th th thank you for doing this. My name is Emil Baroudi. I work for the Magazine TV. I mean, with the situation not showing any sign of it's going to calm down or so, what are the ICRC plans for the future? I know it's a bit macabre to plan for such bad things, but I think it's also part of your... Let's take another question there in the back. Yes, a brief question because we are running out of time. Daniel Amor, Johns Hopkins University. The question is how the Israeli are reacting to the fightings on the just on the other side of the border or the occupied area. Because uh, they were told by the Syrian army, you are helping the fighters, taking care of them and so on. Okay, thank you. Do you want to take these two questions? First one, future, you. the second one. Yes. Well, the plans uh, of the ICRC, well, as you know, we are not entering in uh, the political aspects. <laughs> um, and, uh, but therefore, we um, are continuing all our efforts in order to, uh, first of all, develop our network of um, all actors involved in this conflict. Um, that also, we, we have to uh, increase the network with uh, the armed opposition, uh, with uh, also on the government side, and also especially, and therefore we launched a budget extension in order to increase our humanitarian assistance and uh, to be more present in the country. For example, I was saying Tartus, where we rented warehouses. We hope to have, uh, to be able to open some offices we are regularly, almost on a weekly basis, present in the homes. We try to stay longer in the field <coughs> and to assist the Syrian Arab Red Crescent, the different uh, branches that they have, to also reinforce their emergency stocks. So we are doing some contingency planning, uh, increase our emergency stocks, but more <coughs> to focus on the humanitarian side, but not so much on the political side, but also it is very important that we engage with um, everybody um, and even some states who have influence on Syria. Yes. Mm. Uh, and for Israel, uh, how the Israeli government is responding? Um, to be honest, um, <laughs> yes, what I know that they were um, following some fighting, some wounded, for example, who went to were evacuated to, to Israel. Uh, the Israeli authorities treated them, and but they wanted to come back to Syria. And uh, the ICRC was, well, contacted, but the, the people didn't want through the official channels. Huh? They wanted, uh, so they could go back, but the, because they were opposition and they found their own way. Um, now, I have to admit for the latest um, attacks, um, well, I had just left. I was just during the first attack of the Israelis. Um, and I have to say, on that day, um, it was extremely loud in Damascus, and people panicked very much, and many Syrians tried to find some shelter. And um, But, um, yeah, but I cannot say more about the Israeli response. On yes, uh, one question here, please. Sure. Uh, and then George. Sure. Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Uros Piper. I'm correspondent of Tanyuk News Agency from Serbia, Europe. Uh, my question is, uh, there were accusations that uh, or government forces or rebels used the chemical weapons. Uh, have you seen any sign of that on the ground? Thank you. 
and uh, George. Uh, yes. Yeah, I just uh, I just got back. Uh, I was in, I'm George Cody, American Task Force for Lebanon. I was in uh, Lebanon in April uh, last month and visited two of the camps, in, uh, one of which was Tel Abyad in, uh, in, in the Bekaa, and another one. And right now, the number of refugees in Lebanon has surpassed uh, more than 10 percent of the population. Is there any thought being given to how uh, what could be done to take steps to avoid having a permanent uh, refugee settlement in the country, given the, the experience Lebanon's had with the, with the Palestinian refugees? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, well, to the question of chemical weapons, um, the ICRC cannot confirm or deny that chemical weapons were uh, used or not. Uh, even one of the d attacks in Aleppo, uh, we had just left Aleppo. Um, and uh, so we could uh, have come back uh, to Aleppo, but um, yeah. we it's, it's very difficult to say if it was used or not. Let's not forget that um, any side would a little bit exaggerate and very quickly uh, one side or the other accuse each other that this is uh, so we are w and we were not part in this um, well we were not requested and it, it's not really the ICRC to go and investigate if chemical weapons were used or not in case we would have one day well we, we hope not uh, but some uh, um, con big major concerns that it would have been used we would, uh, I think, engage more, uh, make an intervention on a bilateral, um, yeah, no, bilateral interventions to the groups or authorities concerned. But uh, no, we cannot confirm uh, for the uh, for chemical weapon. Uh, regarding refugees uh, for uh, Beirut, um, the ICRC is, uh, as I said, is trying to support, but but more on the. Uh, the medical part, uh, treating, uh, and especially in the Bika, working closely with the Lebanese Red Cross and even the Lebanese High Relief Committee, but more in the health part. We are not involved in the, in the camps. I think it's mainly UNHCR. Uh, but you're right that we are very concerned about the Palestinian issue because many Palestinians, Palestinian areas and camps in, uh, in Syria have been attacked, like I take the last uh, example of Yarmouk, uh, where you have a lot of groups inside that we have no contacts, we don't know wha who are these groups, so the population have left. We have met even Palestinian families from y Yarmouk ma uh, camp in Tartus and Banyas, who have taken shelter, and many have left uh, to mainly to, to Lebanon, because in Jordan it is much more difficult for them to, um, to be accepted in Jordan, the, the Palestinians. So I don't know what would be uh, f w for the ICRC. Uh, uh, when I was speaking about our budget extension, uh, we are also increasing a little bit our budget for Lebanon and uh, and Jordan in order to better assist uh, the wounded. And we are in contact, in close co contact with UNRWA because it's more the mandate of of UNRWA, which has also a lot of unfortunately difficulties because of this complex Palestinian issue um, but uh, it is a big concern and that's why what I was saying uh, at the end uh, um, uh, of my little presentation if a solution is not found soon a political solution in Syria it's the whole area the whole region which will af be affected it's already affected and it will uh, deteriorate even more um, gentlemen here one last uh, this is our last question. Yes, here. Uh, he has been raising his hand from the beginning. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Eduardo Abreu from USAID. Um, I was wondering if you can speak a little bit to the organizational capacity um, of the local councils to identify and help assist in humanitarian assistance. And on the flip side, the same question for any sort of nefarious extremist group that would is able to fill that same void. Thanks. Okay. Um, so for the um, local committees, we're saying more the local coordination committees um, who are trying to provide also s local NGOs providing assistance. This was the, so uh, 
you have a lot of charity organizations in Syria since even before the events, but they have to be registered re um, and accepted and some, and it's very much localized and they have, especially with such a crisis uh, and uh, such big humanitarian needs, they have very little means. Uh, the UN, uh, UN agencies and uh, the ICRC, we are trying also to assist, well, our main partner still remains the Syrian Arab Red Crescent, but still to assist some NGOs and some associations that in full transparency with the government, uh, because they have also to be registered and accepted, and uh, that we assist them, but they would assist mainly a population in one area of a city. So it's very, very much localized and they count a lot on our, um, our support or sometimes we provide to the Syrian Arab Red Crescent, which as they are present in many areas, they are providing them also with food parcels uh, and uh, non-food items so that they can distribute to the people in need. What we have seen also, res so, but they have a lot of difficulties to uh, respond, let's say, to a whole area or regionally to, to, to in the north or south. What we have seen also, we have a lot of, um, well, with this conflict, some activists uh, started to establish local coordination committees and they took some risks uh, to provide some assistance in in areas uh, controlled by the the opposition because you have also to pass the, the different uh, checkpoints uh, they were also saying that they did not receive because we hear a lot that a lot of humanitarian assistance of or money is being provided here and there but a lot of local coordination committees tell us that they do not have enough means and they have not received uh, what is sometimes announced that millions are being paid here and there. And then uh, what we have seen in some areas, uh, like in Aleppo city, where you have also some councils, um, their members are teachers, engineers, professors, doctors, who have uh, established some committees and who are trying to m make uh, public services, again, functioning and who count a lot on also <laughs> the support of ex well, uh, humanitarian actors to provide them with some assistance. But it's very, it's not centralized, <laughs> it's very disparate. And uh, some areas that we have seen visited, for example, for the first time last month, Mambej, north of Aleppo, for example, we were struck because there were thousands of displaced people uh, from even Aleppo city, from Idlib, from Homs, uh, newly displaced from Raqqa, and they, the sub-branch of the Syrian Arab Red Crescent together with some committees trying still to support. They were receiving some donations from families, poor families, but who gave still some assistance, but had not received any assistance, including from ICRC. Afterwards, we have sent some trucks. So some areas are completely left um, without assistance. Um, thank you very much. This was really very important meeting. We have been holding a number of meetings on Syria since uh, the uh, turmoil started, but this is one of the most important ones because we never get a real report from what is going on when it comes to the humanitarian disaster that is shaping Please, please join me in thanking Marianne Gassi. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.